Hey guys, welcome to the channel. If you like MMOs and haven't done so yet, make sure you hit the subscribe button. In this video, I'm talking about the New World May update that happened on the Alpha uh, today. Actually, they put the notes out and everything. So we're gonna take a look at that and um, let's jump into it. So this is the last major Alpha update. And after this update, they're gonna do a lot of uh, bug patches and cleanup and stuff like that on the game getting ready to make it ready for launch and this alpha is going to end on july 9th i believe and they're still going to be allowing people to come in to the alpha so keep an eye on your email but not only your email that you've signed up for the alpha with but also if you look on your amazon account there's actually a mailbox and sometimes you'll see it in there before you see it in your actual mail or maybe you might just not get it in your actual mail and you'll see it in the amazon mail that's what happened to me one time. So Spotlight, New Expedition, The Shattered Obelisk, journey further into the depths of Amarine Temple to unlock the ancient secrets of the Obelisk Codes. The Shattered Obelisk Expedition is intended for level 35 players and is found in the Everfall territory. There's gonna be a couple of boss encounters here. The Electos the Relentless, this powerful mage has stood guard for untold eons, focusing intense arcane energies from the resonant structure of the obelisk to lay waste to intruders and Grunglugl the regent. Towering above her armies and adorned in brilliant golden armor, this eternal protector of the obelisk treasure guards it from thieves and foolish trespassers alike. And I guess that's this character here i guess they're towering they don't they don't look they're towering but okay if you say so another new expedition called the depths captain thorpe returns his corrupted army has made the ancient ruins below a storm tower on the peninsula of the restless shores their base of operation he now styles himself the master of the tempest the king of corruption from this base he terrorizes the countryside can you thwart his plans this expedition is intended for level 45 players and is found in Restless Shores. And we have a couple of boss here. Archdeacon Asmelia, a servant of Thorpe and leader of his armies. Asmelia is a fanatical adherent of the Twisted Corrupted Doctrine and a conduit for his destructive energies. And Commander Thorpe, having further embraced corruption, Thorpe's attacks and abilities have significantly grown making him a powerful agent of corruption and a deadly threat to a Eternum that must be stopped. And then we have here your character jumping towards a Eternum. Now there's some some cool little things here. We got a little corrupted zones here in Thorpe. Was there something up here too? Yeah, let's check it out. Some more stone walls and some more stairs. Yeah. So this is kind of interesting here. Got to navigate the beams. They've put player titles into the game now. Certain activities such as completing specific achievements will now award displayable titles. Their typo are well over 100 titles and players can choose display. What? <laughs> there are well over 100 titles and players can choose display any one to unlock title or choose to not display a title. Oh, missed the word. They were typing fast on this one. When equipped, titles appear above your character in the world, incorporating your character's name in the title. A title will fall into one of two character, two categories. Account-wide, the title works on any character associated with the account. And character-bound, the title only works on the character who unlocked it. The discoverable fast travel points. Oh, there's even more fast travel points. Distributed throughout Eternum, fast travel points are locations that allow players to fast travel from location to location at the cost of Azoth. The further the distance and the heavier the load you're carrying, the higher the cost for travel. Once a player discovers a point, they can travel to that location from outposts and settlements. So they're still like, yo, we're not putting mounts in this game. They're probably like, how would we even do that? <laughs> yeah, we even make the game for mounts. And so the fast travel points are probably the easiest way to do that. So that's cool. General changes elite points of interest have been updated with new enemy encounters and have revised loot placements. Resources and the distribution of resources have been remapped in each territory to pair better with player progression. So you're not going to see like level 50 stuff in like beginning level, beginning zones. You see a lot of that level 50 trees, level 100 trees in the beginning zones like, uh, bruh. Corruption breaches have been converted to elite content. 
with elite affixes now apply to key enemies in the encounter. Okay. So now the breaches aren't just like you can run up and do them like regularly. Now they're elite content. Quest updates. Added new territory quests in Brightwood, Cutlass Keys, and Weaver's Fin. Added two new quests to the main story quest line to take players into the Depth Expedition to face Commander Thorpe. We have some faction control points. We increased the time required to capture a fort. Solo player capture times have been increased from one minute to five minutes. The required time will decrease with each additional player present up to a full group of five. With five players, a capture will now take two minutes and 30 seconds. Added participation limits to the arena near forts to ensure battles over faction control points don't hurt server performance. These limits ensure that only 25 people per faction may be near the same fort. So, you, so people can't just overrun a fort. Houses and settlements now have tiers. Each tier of houses come with a different cost and a different set of benefits, with the most expensive houses conferring the greatest benefits. Tier 1 is the least expensive. You're going to get house fast travel cooldown of 4 hours. Max pieces of storage furniture allows going to be 1. You can have 5 pets, 4 lights, and you have to have a territory standing of level 10 to purchase it. Tier 2 has a 3 hour house cooldown. You can have two pieces of furniture, six pets, six lights, and you have to be level 15 in that territory. Tier three will have a 2.5 hour cooldown, three storage furniture spots, seven pets, eight lights, and 20 territory stand or 20 territory level. And the most expensive, number four, will have a two hour cooldown. They'll have four pieces of furniture, storage furniture, eight pets, 10 lights, and you have to be level 20. And this is going to allow you to live your crazy cat lady or cat man dream that you want to have in the game. Faction missions, they removed gathering and crafting missions. Why? Why would you remove gathering and crafting missions? Reduce chest and kill count requirements to ensure players can find all targets and aren't required to wait on a respawns. Removed mission board access in territories where the player has not reached the minimum level. Optimized placements on mission POI target locations. Daily bonuses added for the first three faction missions completed each day. Faction missions rewards have been rebalanced and focused more around gaining faction tokens. Man, I don't know about that, man. You need more things to incentivize gathering and crafting missions. And I was wondering if they'll let you be able to just, you know, level up through gathering or level up through crafting, or are you going to have to go through the whole, you know, leveling up process, the old fashioned way of just doing quests and dungeons and stuff, because it'd be kind of cool if, if you just wanted to go in and cut down a bunch of trees. Cause last I remember cutting down trees took forever to level up. So if you could just cut down trees and level up that skill and level up yourself at the same time, that would be kind of cool. Faction missions now award reputation and faction tokens. Players will automatically be granted quests that encourage them to earn enough reputation to achieve their next rank. At which point, they'll be directed to a specific faction representative who will offer a trial quest. Trial quests are now the key to unlock the next faction rank. Faction tokens are no longer required for ranking up. Players can instead spend them exclusively on faction gear and items. Yeah, that was kind of a, a problem with faction in the preview of it, is that you had to spend those faction tokens to level up your to the next faction tier but then when you got there you couldn't buy anything because you spent all your faction tokens and it wasn't like a short amount of time to get all those faction tokens either xp and leveling we've just adjusted our leveling curves and rest experience to speed up leveling for casual players and to introduce new ways of gaining xp the XP per level curve has been adjusted to increase the rewards of doing quests lower than your level. XP for killing monsters has been adjusted. So if you do quests lower than your level, they're going to actually give you something good for it. Gold and silver border monsters now grant more XP when killed. Nice. Expedition quests now grant significantly more XP. Territory standing levels now grant experience when acquired. The number of XP bonus cards that a territory can grant when leveling up has been limited and capped to provide a maximum bonus of 10.3%. Faction missions have 
have their experience rebalanced to match the new leveling curve. Added a daily bonus of 200% XP for the first three faction missions completed. That's a lot of percentage of XP for the first three faction missions. That's definitely going to incentivize more people to do those. Unique POI point of interest now grant more experience when revealed. Gathering trade skills now grant experience per level gained. Smelting trade skills now grant experience per level gain. Crafting trade skills now grant experience per level gain. Journal pages now give increasing experience based on the total number found. Oh, more and incentivized to find the journal pages. If you didn't know, the journal pages is what contains all of the lore in the game. And they also give you some hints from on how to find like some of the um, legendary creatures or like the world boss creatures that are there. Like when Asmongold fought that bear, there's actually a page that talks about the location of this giant bear. There's also like a giant wolf somewhere and uh, some other things. So it's kind of cool. Rest XP. Oh, a deer. There's like a deer out there in the world also. A magical deer. Reduce wait time before beginning to generate rest XP for 12 hours to 8 hours. Raise a cap for total rest XP from 100% of a level to 150% of a level. Decrease the rate at which XP... Rest XP is gained from 2% an hour to 1% an hour. Rest XP now works on all sources of XP. So now you'll be able to get your rest of XP a little bit faster instead of having to wait almost the whole day. Bag slot number one is unlocked at level 10 instead of level one. Oh, geez, so you, oh, okay. The ring slot is still unlocked at level 20 instead of 10, and the ring slot is now unlocked at level 40 instead of 20. Wow, that's a, those are, wow. We'll just have to see how fast you can level up between 20 and 40. We've adjusted PvP flag rewards to incentivize PvP activity and provide a more meaningful reward for in-game players. You will now gain experience, faction tokens, and item rewards when you kill a player. Item rewards when you kill a player? The rewards are based on how long the player has been alive while flagged. Players only drop rewards after a minimum threshold. Removed the 10% experience increase given while being flagged. Uh, so they kind of... Well, I mean, it's a fair trade-off, I guess. So you used to get, like, more experience when you flagged yourself, and then you would just run around. But now, since they incentivize people to actually kill you, and they'll get experience, faction tokens, and item rewards, then you might not want to run around just to have 10% experience. Darkness events no longer give faction tokens. Updated town projects to add a town maintenance category that ensures there are always some projects available to players. Town maintenance missions are always available and giving normal rewards with no project points. Town maintenance has some unique missions requesting various cooking and potion ingredients, as well as more extensive fishing related ingredient requests. All other projects have had smaller, have added a smaller set of food and potion related missions. So they adjusted the gold and how we earn gold. I know in the preview event, you didn't have to do anything, you get a house pretty quick. So I guess now they're getting ready to make the economy actually be an economy. We've adjusted the way players earn go coin to make quests and other one-time activities big sources of wealth while reducing coin from other sources. Decrease the gap in earning gold from lower levels to higher levels. Added a maximum gold cap for players of 500,000. Added a maximum gold cap of companies for 5 million. Are there anybody out there now that has 500,000 gold? <laughs> and will it be hard to get 500,000 gold? Gold sources. Players will earn a large percentage of gold items from quests, expeditions, wars, invasions, and the daily three bonus rewards from faction missions. Players will earn a smaller percentage of gold from killing creatures, faction missions, and corrupted breaches. Creatures now have a chance to drop coin instead of a guaranteed drop. Oh. I, okay. They didn't really drop a guaranteed drop either, though, unless you skinned them. But I guess now you're going to get coin. Um, gold cost. Houses no longer increase in cost based on first, second, third houses. They now increase in cost based on the quality of the house with the prices of 5k, 10k, 15k, and 20k based on the tier of the house. So I think they should have uh, still kept that first, second, third house. But there's no like limit. Like if you buy a house, it doesn't stop somebody else from buying that house. So 
I guess they really didn't need to increase it that way. But I wonder, like, the quality of the house and the tier of the house. Like, <clears throat> I guess you can just have more items. It's not going to change the way the house looks. So if you want a, a good-looking house, make sure you find a good-looking house. Base housing tax has increased from 5% to 10%. Coin cost for repair has been reduced from roughly 50%. And coin costs for repair has been reduced by roughly 50%. I wonder if that was supposed to be say something else, because that says the same thing twice. <laughs> Loot and gear section. Increased cooldowns for large chests and elite point of interest from one hour to 24 hours. Oh, there were only an hour? So I guess that explains why they kind of limited the requirement of finding chests. Added more named weapon drops to discover throughout a turnum, including 260 weapons and trinkets on 130 named monsters in the open world. That's a lot of weapons. 260 weapons is a lot. Weapons and trinkets. Weapons, reward, and drops have been rebalanced to more closely align with player progression. Players will be able to find a new weapon of their favorite type every few levels. Add a new visual variety to weapon and armor sets throughout the game. This includes many of the armors dropped by open world enemies and elites at points of interest. Change the specific weapon rewards for quests and starting zones to ensure new players get a chance to try a wider variety of weapons early on. Oh, nice. Because, yeah, it's a hard time finding different kind of weapons. You might just be running around with one the entire time. So now you'll be able to try more. When players drop items from their inventory, the contents are now visible only to that player. The items will stay in the world for three minutes to help give players a way to organize their backpack, and after three minutes, the items will disappear forever. Players who previously relied on dropping items for trading can use the secure player-to-player -player trading system instead. Well, boo. That's lame. What if people just dropped items to make, you know, in case anybody wanted some of these items? It was kind of cool running around, finding a random sack of something that somebody dropped because they didn't have any more room in their inventory. And just going to pick it up. <laughs> like, yeah, somebody could use this ore. Drop it. And I was like, does anybody need any ore? <laughs> Please take it. <laughs> or hurry up and come here. You got three minutes. Eh, I don't like that change. Tuning orbs. I, I, don't, I like the change where it was only visible to the player for three minutes. But it should be like after that three minutes or something, then everybody can grab it. Or something like that. Tuning orbs. To increase the rewards of expeditions, we have gated entrance to expeditions on one party member having a tuning orb. Tuning orbs will be given for each expedition quest and be grafted from materials around Eternal. Tuning orbs can be crafted with the stone masonry skill, and they have a limited number that can be crafted per week. For higher level expeditions, have a lower amount of crafts per week. So it's like a little attunement. They don't really want people spamming dungeons. Uh, I don't know how that one is, because it's kind of like controlling how people play the content. Experience for one time and repeatable expeditions have been greatly increased. High-level tuning orbs will require more resources, including drops from high-level elite chests. Maximum gear score is now kept at 600. We have adjusted our top and end enemies slightly to ensure that in-game content provides a real challenge while accommodating this change. Crafting resources, consumable buffs, trophies, armor buffs, and lifestyle buffs have all been retuned to accommodate this change. In order to craft items with the highest quality, players must combine bonuses from a variety of sources, trophies, armor, consumables, advanced crafting resources such as Asmodium and the relevant lifestyle bonus from a town project. Wow. <laughs> okay. The highest quality items. You have to do all that. Crafting and gathering. So let's see what they say about this. Crafting armors are now rare drops from containers and elite points of interest. Crafting armors have crafting bonuses and are not intended to be the best armor for combat. Oh, crafting armors, like armors that's like, so it was like blacksmith's gloves or something like that. Okay. Do they have something in there where we can store outfits now though? Or we just have to carry it in our bags? Adjusted skinning XP values to align progression more with other gathering progression rates. Um, what about tree cutting? We found that the relative difference in value between a small, medium, large skinning actions wasn't great enough, which was causing the progression rate to misalign significantly over time with the tanning skill. Reduce the overall gathering speed bonus gain from progressing in a gathering skill 
so we could move it to the potential speed bonus range on gathering tools. Because of this, the tier and gear score of a tool is more impactful, especially when gathering higher tier resources. Equipment sets such as Forsaken or Ancient Equipment now has a chance to drop from creature kills as the base equipment style, which should create more visual variety in player armor and weapons earlier in the game. Adjusted rarity values on some food ingredients, poultry breasts are no longer legendary, even though they're delicious. Adjusted perk rule odds on dropped items at all tiers, specifically to balance the number of epics dropping. Crafting odds are, are tuned separately and have not been changed. Azoth's Val now provides 50 Azoth instead of 13. It only gave 13? What? So Azoth's Val is an item you could, that drops, a legendary item that drops in the game. They had it listed in the auction house during the preview event. I never found one drop from any of the mobs, but it's a container. It says it's a Val of Azoth in a container, and you can trade that to people or in the auction house if you want to sell it. I'm sure I have a lot of value attached to it, being that it's what you need to teleport around the world and stuff. So, it only had 13 in there, though. That's pretty terrible. Dyes. Increase the number of craftable dyes and added more dye pigments to find in the world. Dye pigments now come from a special type of plant called Prisma Bloom. Faction-specific dyes can now be purchased from each faction store. Furnishings. While the furnishing system was functional, we weren't happy with the play trends we were seeing due to the few issues. As such, we have changed our approach to furnishing to focus on recipe acquisition. What kind of trends were people doing with furniture? A limited number of recipes are available to craft by default. The rest are available as either finished pieces or as unlockable recipe schematics, Schema schematics found in large chests around the world. These recipes have a minimum level restriction to avoid overwhelming players early in the game, so players can't expect to start finding them after the minimum house ownership level. Schematics and completed furniture can be traded at the trading post. Players can craft the base version of a trophy, but now must upgrade trophies by combining that base version with special items found elsewhere in the game. The most potent trophies can only be crafted by finding special artifacts as rare drops. There is a much wider variety of furniture available both as drops and schematics, and more will be added in future updates. Now we're on the UX and the UI. Social actions menu, quick access. All right, to provide easier access to social tools, we replaced the wave shortcut with a quick shortcut to the social action menu for any nearby player. When aiming at a player, a small H for hint is shown in the nameplate, which is pressed, brings up the social actions menu along with mouse control for quickly choosing an option or dismissing the menu. So can we still Put wave at something else, I guess. I kind of like waving to people. Direct message, invite to group, invite to company, add friend, invite to trade, challenge to duel. You can't expect anybody, though. Huh. Group kick. The addition of expeditions to New World has made it clear that players needed more control over groups, so we added a vote-based kick mechanic. Eh? At any time, any group member can initiate a vote to kick via the social actions menu which creates a one-minute voting window for the rest of the group to answer. There is personal cooldown of 10 minutes be between kicks, and some additional restrictions may be added in the future. People are going to get kicked just for not being liked, or not being able to play well, or they died too much. Enemy AI. This update completes our initial AI update based on all characters for core combat mechanics. We will be closely monitoring the effects of these updates and evaluating more ways to improve updated the Isabella's pets bonus in boss encounter and the dynasty shipyard expeditions. Isabella now leads her forces on the field of battle to confront those who have dared vandalize her fleet of ships. For balance, they adjusted block stamina damage to better align with skill and playstyle usage, adjusted the base damage, critical hit chance, and critical damage multiplier of all weapons to make them have a more notable difference on a base stat level. Adjusted the value of perks granted by gems to better fit with the other changes made to consumables, armor, and weapons. We've changed some legendary block instability for armor and block. We re reduced equip load block stability bonus when in heavy equip load from 25% to 15%. Disabled the sturdy perk for being able to be placed on swords. Now it will only be available on shields and all other melee weapons. This will prevent it from stacking with itself on a sword and shield build. 
Reduce heavy armor damage mitigation by 5% and increase light armor damage mitigation by 5%. Attributes, they increase the rate that attributes can be earned to help with combat balance in early levels. Each level grants two attribute points in the early level and later levels grant fewer attributes per level, requiring players to utilize attributes on equipment. I was wondering about that because the last time they were saying you can go up to like 300 points in an attribute, I think. So I was like, how are you going to do that? There's not that many levels in the game. Reduce the effect of several attribute threshold bonuses to balance out power of bonuses with various weapons, mastery abilities, and perks. So they reduced the strength of 50, 100, and 200 to from 5% to 15%, 10 to 20%. Um, you guys can read all this. I have the link in the description for everything that's been reduced here. We're going to go down to the base mana and consumables. Uh, mana regeneration is re increased. It now takes 50 seconds to fully regenerate mana instead of 57 seconds. Remove increase in mana regeneration rate from the focus attribute. Regeneration rate stays consistent at all levels and can only be modified by abilities, consumables, and perks. So now focus is really just used for healing stuff. Yeah, that was the only other thing. Cooldown rate and uh, consumables. <clears throat> Consumables reduce damage bonus from honing stones from five to fifteen percent to four to seven percent. Oh, big nerf. Decrease mana granted per second from regeneration potions. Stacking tier five food and focus potions would now cause mana to fully regen in roughly thirty seconds, opposed to previously where mana would be infinite while the consumables are active. Mana potions increase mana granted from thirty to eighty mana to forty to one hundred mana based on tier. Increase cooldown from ten seconds to fifteen seconds. Mana food, extended duration of the food from 10 minutes to 20 minutes to 40 minutes, depending on tier. Change the mana food to increase mana regenerate instead of giving flat mana increase every second. And instead of gathering mana every second for the duration of the status effect, mana food now increases mana regen rates by based on tier. Uh, focus potions decrease additional mana granted per second from focus potions. Previously, focus potions were too strong and would negate all mana loss. Extended duration from 30 seconds to 60 seconds. Straight sword and shield. Increased rate attack damage for basic attacks and multiple abilities. Reduced base block stability range for round, kite, and tower shields by 10 to 25%, depending on shield type and tier. Reduce the damage bonus of several passive abilities that were causing light attack spams to be too powerful. Reduce stamina reduction for several abilities while blocking ranged and melee attacks. For the hatchet, they increase attack damage for basic attacks and multiple abilities, reduce a block stability by 10%, and adjusted damage and cooldowns of several weapon mastery abilities. Yeah, the hatchet nerf that they did a couple of patches ago was really bad. The rapier had has increased base damage, attack damage for light and heavy attacks, and increased block stability by 13%. The spear adjusted attack damage for basic attacks and several spear abilities, reduced block stability by 8%. Uh, adjusted attack damage for basic attacks and several abilities. Adjusted attack damage for basic attacks and several abilities for the Great Axe, Warhammer, and the Bow. They increase Bow Heavy Attack Damage. And for the Musket, they adjusted damage for multiple abilities. For the Life Staff, they increase Heavy Attack Damage, increase Block Stability by 33%, and reduce Mana Cost of many abilities due to Focus no longer increasing Mana Regeneration Rate. For the Fire Staff, they increased attack damage for heavy attacks and several abilities and adjusted the mana cost and cooldowns of several abilities. And for the Ice Gauntlet, they've increased attack damage from heavy attack damage and the Entombed Break ability. And they set stability to a flat 30% instead of scaling off of tiers. And here we got some screenshots here for the, the game. Oh, you got a duck under those. Huh, <laughs> interesting. This looks kind of cool. She kind of looks, it's supposed to be like a skeleton person in an armor, I guess. They kind of look like Vision with a sword. Oh, the yeah, jacked up. The Great Axe. So this all looks kind of cool. So we got about three and a half months until the game comes out. And they're doing all the balancing and patching and cleanup and polishing before the game comes out. So this is going to be the final alpha patch that they have, but that doesn't mean they're not going to be working on the game, um, you know, until launch and working on the game after launch. So they said in their little dev letter they just had that the launch is going to be day one. And from there, they'll be adding, you know, more people will have more feedback at that point. 
instead of just who was in the alpha. So they'll be taking all that feedback in and making more changes probably. Um, I'm in agreement with a lot of people that I don't like all of these dungeons only having two bosses. It feels kind of reared and short. Like we're used to dungeons having three, four bosses. So two bosses just depending on how like how long the dungeon is, or if there's like a mini boss in there somewhere maybe. So we'll have to see I guess when the game comes out. But what do you guys think of these changes? There are some okay ones in here. There are some I think there are some bad ones. I think the most interesting thing is the two new dungeons they added into the game that hit in the mid-level section, uh, 35 and 45, and some of the changes to how experience works with the factions and stuff was pretty interesting. Let me know what you guys' thoughts are in the comments, and I'll see you guys in the next video.